I know the, the death of every believer is precious in the sight of the Lord, and so it is any saints from Briarwood that go home. But I do have to mention Miss uh, Lois. Uh, I am going to greatly miss her. Uh, she is a, an extraordinary woman. I mean, more than she's in the 1960s, the first African-American by profession of faith and joining Briarwood and has been such an encouragement in our, our desire to be more diverse. But more than that, even her mentorship under Dr. Barker, her fellowship with so many, and then, the, and then Lois's house, the Grace Home, my goodness. And now Pam, Pam Phipps, who carries it on, we praise God how she's reproduced herself in this godly lady who will carry that ministry forward, and we can enjoy, continue to enjoy see it. I just want to praise the Lord for that. Would you look with me in 1 Peter chapter 4, and, and check and go with me to this, our third study in this paragraph. Now, can I say one more thing? I've been encouraged. It's taken me a while. This passage is just jam-packed. And so, I'm trying to draw some things out appropriately without having two-hour sermons. And uh, so, we, this is our third study. We got one more coming up on it, and it'll be four of them in this paragraph. But many of you have mentioned to me how this paragraph was used in your conversion and starting your Christian life and has contained some key verses for you in life. And I'm grateful because this is a passage that is joy gloriously overwhelming. And I want to focus on one element this morning. Look with me there in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be sober or, I'm, I'm sorry, be sound or self-controlled and sober-minded, sound-minded, sober-minded, for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied or multifaceted grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him be long glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Praise the Lord. The grass withers, the flower fades. God's Word abides forever. By His grace and mercy, may His Word be preached for you. Please be seated. When your dad and mom go to be with the Lord, there are, things, there are things you're glad that you saved, and there are some things that you wish you'd ask, and some things that you wish you'd saved. And I'm going to mention something. You might wonder, why would you want to save that? But it was my mother to the T. When I would get home, baseball practice, school, baseball practice, football, basketball, whatever it was, I'd get home. My sisters can all bear testimony to this. There would be waiting for us a... Um, a, what is it, three by four, whatever, just a white note piece of paper, maybe an index card. And this is the way it would start off. I wished I still had one, but I already know, and I can tell you what was on it, even though I don't have it, because almost every day of my life when I got home, there would be one for me from my mom. Hope you had a good day at school, meaning hope you didn't embarrass me. Secondly, you may make yourself a sandwich, but do not make a mess. My mother, look up obsessive compulsive in the dictionary, her picture's right there. Uh, then my, the uh, third thing that she would then is she would say, do the following things, and there would be a list. Uh, anywhere from three, four, five, six, seven things, and then at the bottom, it would say, I'll be home soon. That was not written so much for comfort uh, as it was accountability. I'll be home soon. And uh, the other thing that I want you to know is my mother had a mechanism that she would list the things, and you knew everything was important, but invariably, one of those things would be underlined sometimes twice with an exclamation, and you knew when she got home everything needed to be done, but brother, if you didn't get that one done, there's a good possibility your life had just ended on planet Earth right then. 
So that one, that one, that was underlining exclamation point. We have arrived at a point in a text where Peter has borrowed from my mother. <laughs> Peter, of course, has called us elect exiles. We have been set free from the bondage of sin, and we are exiles serving Christ on the way to the promised land of a new heavens and a new earth. And it wasn't a Moses that set us free from slavery. It was a Savior who set us free from the bondage of our sins. And He has taken great pains to give us, and by the way, I've put it on the back of your note sheet so you can take it home with you, 14 blessings that He has secured on the cross for us. 14 blessings. And the 14th blessing was this one. The end is at hand. The next thing on the redemptive calendar of the Almighty is the coming of Christ. That's what's next. After all of the elect have been saved, after the nation has been preached to all, all, after the gospel has been preached to all the nations, then Christ's coming. He is coming. He is near. We'll be home soon. And after giving us all that, he reminds us, on the way home, you're going to suffer. And he takes from 1 Peter 3, verse 13, all the way through chapter 5, verse 11, and 20 plus times, he tells us directly, you are going to suffer for Christ's sake. Every believer, in some way, at some time, to some degree, will suffer for Christ. This is not the suffering that comes in a broken world. This is directly the blessing that Christ says in the Beatitudes, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. So he has already told us. Now, he's told us who you are in Christ. Then he gives us seven gospel commands. The last two kind of run together. He said, arm yourself with the mind of Christ. You want to know how to suffer for Christ? Look at the way Christ suffered for you. Have this mind in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but taking the form of a bondservant, he was found in appearance as a man, and he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, and he suffered that death to save us from our sins. Now, look at that humbling of Christ to see how it has been granted unto us not only to believe in Him, but to suffer for His sake. And as Paul says, all who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So, how do you do that? He takes almost a, a, over a third of the epistle to teach us about this. And he says, you need the mind of Christ. And then he gives a seventh command. When you get the mind of Christ, there will be two things that will mark it, and that will unleash a life of prayer. Be sober-minded. The mind of Christ is a sober mind and a sound, self-controlled mind. With Christ coming, there will be all kinds, with, with persecution, there's going to be a tendency to start thinking all kinds of novel stuff. With Christ coming again soon, there's all going to be all kinds of people that are going to distort the second coming of Christ. You be sound-minded. Have your mind informed from God's Word. Be filled with the Spirit. Be sober-minded. Be sound-minded. Now, having given us these gospel commands that we do not to be saved, but because of the blessings our Savior has given us, now that He's given us this, He's telling us these seven things we are to do. These, by the way, there's a couple of more coming before we get through with First Peter. But He's given us these seven things, and then in the midst of this, He now says something like my mom. He just underlines and He puts an exclamation point. Above all things, keep on loving one another fervently, earnestly. Above all things. That's what Peter's principled priority is given to us. As you know who you are as the elect in Christ because of what Christ has done. As you now endeavor to embrace gospel commands for Christ above all things, you got that list. I remember when I got home, had a list. All those things needed to be done. But the one that was underlined, that was above all the other things. What is it that Peter says is above all 
things. Now get your Bibles and open them up with me to that First Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. And look with me at it. Let's look a little closer. Now, folks, can I ask you to do something right now? Just pause for a minute. <clears throat> we are going to look at part of this today. The redemptive love that we're to have for each other. That's what we're going to look at. It's not all we, that's not all there is, though. We're also going to later look at the serving love we're supposed to have. We're going to get to that. I'm not going to try to do it today. As each one of you have received a spiritual gift, employ it in serving one another. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts and how they're to be employed. Multifaceted, varied spiritual gifts, how they're to be employed, serving love. But right now, this morning, I just want us to look at the, the uh, two verses that deal with redemptive love. Love that lays hold of sinners saved by grace and doesn't let go as Christ's love that lays hold of us. We lay hold of each other. While Christ is coming, under assault as the world marginalizes, as the world mocks, as the world maligns, as the world would even martyr us, what are we supposed to do? Hold tight. Blessed be the tie that binds us in Christian love. And Peter is going to be very, very specific about it. And I want you to look at it with me, this redemptive love. That's all we're going to look at this morning. And then look at it with me in, um, in, verse eight, in verse 8. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Now, stop right there, just that point right there. Above all things. Now, stop. What is he not saying? He's not saying instead of all things. All these other commandments were given in the Bible as to what we're supposed to do because we love Jesus who has saved us. You don't do them to be saved. You do them for your Savior. All of those things, you don't love in place of those things. Nor is love the sum of all those things. Nor is love to be isolated from those things. Nor is love instead of all those things. It is a love that is above as a canopy of all the things we're doing. It's not in place of the things that Christ has given us to do. It's not instead of the things that Christ has given us to do. It's not isolated from the things that Christ has given us to do. But it is to be above all things of what Christ has given us to do. It is to be, here's your three things, intentional. It is to be intense and it is to be inviting. It is to be intentional. It is to be intense. It is to be inviting. Above all, be intentional about this love. It is to be a love that… Now, why is it that, that Peter has laid hold of this notion of underlining loving one another as above all things? Well, it could be it could be because of the love that Christ intentionally brought into his life even when he denied him three times, and he knows the value of it. Likely, it is the echo, of, it is the echo from Peter's heart inspired by the Spirit of what he heard Jesus say up in the upper room. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. And then he gives you why it's a new commandment. Are we commanded to love one another in the Old Testament? Absolutely. So what does it mean, a new commandment? Because of the vista and the dynamics and the vitality of this love indicated by the rest of the sentence. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. The love of Christ was prophesied in the Old Testament, but it is documented in his life and in the New Testament. What do you find out about this intentional love? It is an active love. It's not just a passive emotion. It is passionate and it is emotive, 
but it is volitional. It is an action. I love, one of my favorite passages is Romans 5. For God demonstrates his own love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies, while we were helpless, Christ died for us. You all know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. It is an act, love that is this proportion is an intentional, active love with passion, and it is relentless. It is not earned. And when it is, when it is ignored, or when it is taken for granted, or when it is not returned, it doesn't stop. It doesn't take into account wrong suffered. It is patient. It is forbearing. It is not irritable. It is relentless. It is unstoppable. It is continual. It is aimed at those who need it, when they need it, how they need it. Not that they are seeking it, not that they deserve it, not that they earn it, but that they need it. I want you to have that kind of love. And then he doesn't finish there. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, the world will know that you are my disciples. This will mark you out. This will unleash evangelism. By this, the world that has no sense of it, now to some sense because of God's common grace, but the depth of redeeming love where sinners lay hold of one another with the truth of the gospel, with patience and perseverance and consistency, it's just not known. And when they see it. So what he's saying is this. Here you are, as uh, one of my mentors, Dr. Uh, Pastor Martin says, here he's, he's called you into this vital vertical relationship, the mind of Christ, the Spirit of God giving sobriety, sober, self-controlled, all of this that's taking place out of, out of arming yourself with the mind of Christ and cultivating so, a sober life and a sound life. Now you move from the vertical, and now you move to the horizontal, and you've got all kinds of commandments from the Lord, all these things to do, but above all, keep on loving one another. Underline, exclamation point, keep on loving one another. By this will they know that you are my disciples. Your brothers and sisters, as the Christ is coming, the end is drawing closer. Your brothers and sisters maligned and mocked and marginalized. Some have even died for Christ, martyrdom. What do you do? Keep on loving one another. Your brothers and sisters who still have sin living in them, what do you do? Wait for them to get better and then start loving them? No. Love them. Love them. Love one another. So he calls, you to this, calls us to this intentionality, then he gives us intensity. And he gives us intensity, I believe, uh, three ways. Number one, he calls us to a brotherly love. Do you see this? Keep on, by the way, look at it. It says, it says it, in the original language, you could translate it this way grammatically in verse 8, um, above all, keep loving, keep on loving. In other words, you're doing it. Now, keep on doing it. Keep on loving one another. Keep on loving one another and um, uh, earnestly. And so, what he's calling you to is to keep on loving one one another earnestly. And then he accentuates the intensity because he's talking about family love. He's talking about brotherly love. Now, this is what's interesting. The Greek language, at least I think this is interesting, The Greek language has six words for love. Six. Guess what the word for family love is? Storge. I know you know what the word for brotherly love is. What is that? Phileo. We get the word Philadelphia. I will not go there. But phileo, brotherly love. 
He's calling us to continue brotherly love, continue family love, but he doesn't use storge. He doesn't use phileo. When he calls us to this family love, when he calls us to this brotherly love, he uses that virtue word of love, agape, a sacrificial love, a love that is based upon the love of Christ who gave himself for us, a sacrificial love, a love that is absolutely sacrificial in all of its dynamics. But not only does he bring us to the intensity of sacrificial love for one another in the family and as brothers and sisters, he then secondly brings us to an awareness of the intensity of this by telling us in the text, by telling us in the text what this love actually does. Look at the next part. Keep on loving one another earnestly, for love covers a multitude of sins. Now, what is he saying there? Is, well, I'll tell you, let me do it this way. Let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying that our love can make an atonement for someone else's sins in that sense of covering. Clearly, the Bible tells us there's only one who can atone for our sins, and that is Christ, who by the love of Christ has given himself for us. So, the atoning blood of Christ is what pays for our sins. So, he's clearly not talking about that. Nor is he talking about ignoring sins. Because the Bible says, if your brother sins, reprove him. The Bible says, if your brother sins against you, go to him. Take one or two with you. The Bible tells us if, you're, if, if, your brother, if, if you have aught against your brother and he sinned against you, Matthew 5, Jesus tells you in the Sermon on the Mount how to deal with it. No, the Bible is not telling us that we can atone for sins in this, nor is Peter saying to us that we are to ignore sins for this. But he is telling us, that God's people know what it means to put a blanket over multitudes of sin. Not all of them. But there is a sense of covering the multitudes of sin. It is my conviction, and again, I'm grateful to my mentors for this, and grateful to John Stott in his, in his uh, commentary on this. I think Peter has beating in his mind two passages of Scripture that he's communicating to us. You got your Bibles in front of you? Go back with me to the book of Proverbs, which is, by the way, why I like for you to be here at Ecclesiastes, because Ecclesiastes is Solomon's record of getting back to Proverbs after having left Proverbs with a life of recalcitrance and uh, that he needed to repent of. But so let's get back to Proverbs. So go back with me to Proverbs, and when you get to Proverbs, slip over to the 10th chapter. I believe that there's two verses that are in his mind at this point. Proverbs chapter 10, and take a look with me in verse 12. Proverbs 10 and verse 12. Here's what he says. He says in Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. So what does someone who love, what do you do? Well, if you hate people, you take their offenses and their sins, and you magnify them, and you expose them. Now, you don't ignore the sins, but when you love somebody, you don't unnecessarily expose them, nor do you use their sin as a cause to separate them from others who are trying to reach them. Hatred stirs up. Love covers. Yesterday, I did a wedding. It was a great blessing, and um, for multiple reasons. Uh, in fact, I got a bunch of them lined up this summer. Um, our ministry at Briarwood, whew, mercy, people are starting to hear this love one another. In fact, I may need to back off this love one another thing. 
And uh, so, um, so I'm, you know, anticipate that, and I enjoy the counseling, and I enjoy everything. But, and then I watch them. I love to watch it when the bride comes in, and the guy looks, and <laughs> you just melts, and it's a glorious moment. Uh, I just love that moment, and, and I love it when they're standing in front of me, and I know what's in their mind. This is so wonderful. We're married. This is going to be great, and and I know. There's, I'm, I, there's a good possibility I'll get a call three weeks from now. Pastor, could we get some counseling? You know why? Because in a marriage, and I got sisters. Don't go ask them about me. Please, don't go ask them. Isn't it amazing when you're in an intimate relationship and you, in a family, you really get to know each other? And you get to see things that nobody else sees. The more intimate the relationship, the more you see. And you don't have to question indwelling sin. You actually know, yeah. It's what I want to tell married couples. You don't know what you got till you got what you want. Then you find out. And you know what you're going to find out? that we do sin in thought, word, and deed. And folks, we do sin. And not all sin is equal. All sin rightly calls for the judgment of God because it's rebellion against God. That does not mean, I hear people say this all the time. Well, I mean, that's sin, sin. No, sin's not sin. Well, Harry, if you get angry at someone, isn't that the same thing as murder? Yes, it is. But I haven't stabbed them yet. Therefore, somebody's still got a daddy and a mother. Somebody's still got a daddy. Somebody's still got a father. Sin has varying degrees of heinousness in its consequences. You learn that in a family, don't you? If your child talks back to you, uh, or if your child spills something at the table, you know the difference. There's proportionality. And when God's people are living together, they don't magnify something beyond what it is for their own self-righteousness. They learn how to deal with each other. They learn how to be patient with each other. And whatever they do, as they're not ignoring the sin but dealing with the sin, they don't unnecessarily expose one another. And they certainly don't use it to divide one another up. In fact, go with me to one other passage. Go with me to Proverbs 17. Proverbs 17. And look with me in verse 9. Just slip over there. Proverbs 17 and verse 9. Whoever covers an offense seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates close friends. There are some people that will take what somebody does and not only magnify it beyond what what it was, but will also use it to stir up strife and will also use it to divide people. The Bible calls those schismatics. They'll do so in the name of truth and in the name of dealing with sin, but they're not really dealing with sin in the way that the Bible tells us. If your brother sins, you don't go announce it, you go to him. And then you take one or two that are spiritually minded people. And even when you tell it to the church, and may I stop here right now, I have had the great privilege to serve this congregation for 20 years, and I've, I serve a congregation where the elders take serious this matter of church discipline. And when it gets to the elders, I have been gloriously blessed by their utmost efforts to maintain confidentiality in such cases. And that is exactly what we ought to do. We don't unnecessarily expose one another. We love one another in this matter where we are covering, not ignoring, but dealing proportionately and appropriately the sins that are before us. And then he gives us another level of intensity, a level of intensity because of the word he uses, agape, because of its, of its blessing of covering sins redemptively as we win one another from sins in the Lord and we don't unnecessarily expose each other. And then thirdly, he says this, love one another, look at the adverb, earnestly, fervently, One of my dear friends, uh, elders in this church, shared with me his own research in this, and I'm grateful for it. It's It's only used this way one other time in Luke, and it refers to how Jesus prayed in the garden. Jesus' prayer in the garden was fervent. What, you remember what he did? 
His capillaries bursted with blood. That's the intensity. Now, what you see him in prayer, that's what we're supposed to be in, in love. In fact, it's an interesting word. It means to stretch. It means to, it's a word that refers to people or horses or something in a race. Stretching to the finish line. I had the opportunity to watch my daughters run in high school and college, and I won't embarrass whichever one it was. I got it down to two, but I won't, I won't single out one. But I went to one with, it was the state championship, and she'd done well. The, the races she was supposed to win, she had already won, but she decided, Dad, I want to take on the 800 meters. Well, I said, hey, you know, hey, that's another different thing about, you know, fast twitch muscles and speed and everything else. And she said, well, I just want to try it. So we prayed about it, thought about it. She got into the race, and things were going good. I always, when they ran, I always put myself down at the what's called the third quarter where you come to the stretch. Sound familiar? That's the stretch where you're stretching out to the end. That's supposed to be the fastest of everything in the race. You're giving it all. Nothing's going to be left. You're going to strain out. Well, sure enough that her competitor who was an unbelievably fine young lady passed her as we went into the, as they went into the stretch and i just yelled out go go but i couldn't all i could see was behind i couldn't see what was happening at the finish line but then when they but uh, but i saw the girl pass her and i just wondered and i keep wanting to say her name <laughs> don't don't quit keep stretching keep running and at the end i watched the stands who was cheering and i saw our team our high school cheer. And I said, she won. I didn't know how, I didn't know how. Later, I got a chance to look at the official film. She won by three one hundredths of a second. And she came back and she stretched at the end to the point she went down, put everything at it, and won by three one hundredths of a second giving it all. That's the way we love each other. Stretch it out. Stretch it out all the way. Give ourselves completely. I think Paul, I think Peter not only has heard his Savior, not only sees the need of this with the coming of Christ and the persecution from the world, he also had experienced it and watched it as a pastor. One last passage, and I'm going to close in prayer. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Turn to Acts chapter 2. Here's what Peter experienced in the first church where he began as the pastor evangelist. 3,000 come to Christ. This is how they're living for Christ. Acts chapter 3 and verse, I'm, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2, and slip down to verse 42. And they, that's the believers, the family of God, the church at Jerusalem, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings, distributing the proceed to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. So here they are stretching out. If I got something to sell to help my brother, when Stephen gets stoned, they don't abandon him, they surround him. When people are in need, they, and then not only that, they do something else. They open up their home for each other. Well, Peter has remembered that. So Peter not only talks about an intentional love, not only talks about an intense love, that's stretching with everything devoted to accomplishing what needs to be done in each other's life. Then he says it's an inviting love. Do you see how he ends it? And can I give you the, what is, I think, the grammatically faith, grammatical faithful exposition of this? Keep fervent. He says, Keep on loving each other fervently, stretching out. 
using hospitality without murmuring. Instead of exposing the one in sin, open the door and share your table. And if they don't acknowledge it, don't murmur. Just keep opening your heart and your home and your table. Hospitality, using, I love, uh, I love that uh, series I heard from Pastor Martin on the open door and the shared table. Uh, and there's so much to say, but that you're opening your heart. See, that's what love, does. see, what's the difference between lust and love? Here's, lust is a passion to take possession and have. So, young ladies, this is not in the sermon, but I'll give it, I just want to share it anyway. You remember that any man who has a passion to take what is not yet his, to have it, is not a man that can love you. Love is not a passion to take and have. Love is a passion to give and bless. Stretch out. Open up your home. Well, they didn't write a thank you note. They didn't bring a happy gift. Well, invite them back. Keep on doing it. So here's the takeaway, and I'll close in prayer. Here's your takeaway. In the, at the coming of Christ draws nearer, and sufferings for Christ greater. A sober and sound mind of Christ calls us to love one another intentionally, intensely, and invitingly as we open up our homes and our hearts for one another, bringing one another into our lives. You're in this world for Christ. Plant your feet. Stand firm for Christ. Keep your eyes to the Lord. He's coming. And open your heart and your home and your table to one another. Lay hold of one another with the love that reflects the love of Christ for you. A relentless, unstoppable, unmerited, but redemptive love for one another's and for one another in, your, in, in this life for Christ. The end is near. The assault is going to intensify. Stand firm with your feet planted. Put the eye of faith upon heaven. Your Savior is coming. And open your heart and your home to one another. Show the love of Christ that was for you as we love one another in Christ for Him. Folks, let me just say two things. You can't do this without Christ. Let me, let me go further. What Peter has said, not only can you not do without Christ, you don't want to do it. In fact, you may even be thinking now, when will this vain babbler get through with this stuff? My home's a castle. I got the moat around it. I may let the bridge down every once in a while. <laughs> Open heart, open home, shared table for the brethren. Well, maybe those who know how to thank me. No, it's those that need you. It's those that need you. Without Christ, you can't do this. Without Christ, you don't want to do it. But if you got Christ, this is resonating. And with Christ, you can do it. And for Christ, you can do it. And you can keep growing in it and take joy in it. Oh, the glory of that privilege to love one another with a tie that binds us together in Christ. Covering multitudes of sin, not exposing each other, but dealing with sin by loving each other, even opening up our resources to care and love one another well. I want you to know something. When I'm preaching God's Word, when I'm preaching God's Word, there's a great challenge for me. 
One is I preach expository, so I don't want to handle a text without the context. Secondly, I want the text to be understood. Thirdly, I want the text to be applied. And whenever you apply a text, there's three things a preacher does. He affirms God's people in their obedience. He exhorts them to new and greater obedience. And he admonishes them to leave disobedience. I want you to know, so I know there's some exceptions, individual exceptions, but this congregation, I have no, I have no admonishment today. I have been the, in fact, I have been awed, inspired, and instructed by your love, your hospitality, missions, conferences, to missionaries, day in, day out, people that are sick, people that are dying. I stand, I honestly, I stand amazed at it. I just tell people, Briarwood's not a big church, it's a small town. I just, I'm amazed at it. I love it. I love it. I benefit from it. I watch it. I mean, it's just, it overwhelms me. So I have no admonishment. But I do say this. Press on. Excel still more in the love of the brethren that a world that's polarized and disintegrating will marvel at how we love one another. And from that, how we can love them in and for the Lord. He's coming. That glorious triad, faith, hope, and love. Your faith will be disfused as the eyes of faith are replaced by the eyes of sight when you see your your Savior. Your hope will disappear because it is no longer a hope You will be with your Savior. But love, it'll abide forever. Let's do it well now, anticipating what it'll be like then. And may others join us when they want to know who gives you the ability to love like this. Let's pray. Just let the Holy Spirit speak to your heart. You say, Pastor, I, I want that, and I know I can't want it. I can't want to love like that, or I can't love like that without Christ, so I'd like to give my life to Christ today. Oh, I can't tell you how that would rejoice, how we rejoice, and the angels will rejoice. If you'll just come up here, there'll be those up here at the front, to both my left and my right, who would love to pray with you. Pastor, I really want to excel and grow in this. I'd like to pray about it. Well, they'll be able to pray with you as well. But let me now pray with you and for me. Oh, God, thank you for the love of Christ. Thank you for its relentless pursuit of us because of the relentless love that Christ has for us. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who stays pursuing us to draw us. Thank you for the way you have dealt patiently with us and not exposing us, not exposing our thoughts, our words, our deeds, but you have convicted us, and then Jesus has paid for them. And now you've given us a body of believers and a family of God, and we, and we will really know each other. Lord, uh, please deliver us from this drive-by church stuff where I go hear a talk on Sunday morning and and a concert that's uh, of music, and I may come back the next Sunday. Please help us be a community of believers, a family. Help us reflect the marriage of Christ as bride. But when we do that, we're going to see some things in each other that you won't see without that intimacy and without that commitment. Then may the love of Christ excel at such moments as we redemptively cover sins to help one another walk away from sin. And as we open our homes and our hearts, stretching ourselves out in fervency and earnestness to love each other well in Christ and for Christ. I pray in Jesus' name. Praise God. Amen.